Kanoria, Professor P. V. Sharma. Now I will request to Dr. Debashis Khan from IIT BHU to kindly present memento to our session chair. So, so tomorrow evening we have the Vedic India quiz competition. So today we at six o'clock we have the screening test. So for that please register at the book counter and come for the screening test to the Maitri Seminar Hall at six o'clock. And uh, for each team there has to be three team members and you have to write also the screening test as a team. So this is the last and final call. Tomorrow we will not be able to entertain anyone uh, coming to participate in the quiz uh, and the right at the competition. Now we will have a uh, 10 minutes break for refreshment and uh, again we will meet uh, in three parallel auditoriums for the parallel sessions and the, uh, the first session will be uh, held in this same auditorium. The second will be at Gargi Auditorium and the third one at Mathid Auditorium. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, so this session is one of the parallel sessions. Let me use the So this is one of the parallel sessions that is scheduled now. And uh, this session we will be listening to the views of the the first three prize winners of the All India Essay Competition that was held for the AISSQ. So the topic was uh, for the essay competition, all of you might be aware in the AISSQ conference every year we have an essay competition. So the, this year the essay competition topic is Contribution of Ancient India to Science. Uh, so now we, I present to you all the three uh, prize winners. Uh, Rishika Behra, Bits Pilani, third prize. Please come on the dais. Abhishek Desh Pandey from Mahatma Pule Agricultural University, Maharashtra, second prize winner. Please come on the dais. And Arokia Raj, Pratiksha Major Semin Seminary, New Delhi. Please come on the dais. This first prize winner. So first I request Rishika to present her views. You have been given a time span of 15 minutes followed with 5 minutes for question answers. We will take the question answers for all the speakers in the last. So, Vishika, please go ahead. So, I will just read a short biography of the of Rishika. Rishika is currently a final year BE student in electronics and electrical engineering at Bits Pilani. <coughs> While her main interest is in the field of electronics, she has recently developed an amateur level interest in the history of science. In the recent past, she worked on a self-study assessment assignment based on the scientific revolution for a course entitled Main Currents of Modern History at her college. In the near future, she plans to pursue a vibrant research career in the field of electronics. 
So, the title of Rishika's presentation is Contributions of Ancient India to Modern Sci to Science, Ayurveda and Yoga. Yes, Rishika. A warm afternoon to everyone present here. I am Rishika Behra. I'm currently pursuing my BE honors at Bits Filani. And I'm here to present my ideas on the topic of the essay competition, which is contributions of ancient India to science in the field of Ayurveda and yoga. So before proceeding, I would like to quote uh, Dr. Albert Einstein. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. In the course of writing this essay, during my research for this essay, uh, I realized in trying to unveil the secrets of uh, Ayurveda and Yoga, how much there is to learn. I mean, even with the minute research that I have done, I could realize that the, the field of uh, India's greatness in, in the domain of ancient science is huge. And probably that is why centuries before Einstein, our ancient seers gave us this thought, Vidya Dadati Vinayam, the mark of true education is humility. And therefore I stand here with all humility uh, to present my ideas. And uh, uh, I would humbly acknowledge that uh, I have a very preliminary idea in this field. And I am indeed honored to present my ideas before, a knowledge, uh, before an audience, which is very accomplished in terms of uh, knowledge, experience, and education. Thank you all. So proceeding. Healing. When we were kids, we were taught about uh, the adventures or the, or the experiences of early man. We were taught about fire. We were taught about how he started sowing seeds and uh, cultivating crops and how he invented the wheel. But probably in all this, we were never taught about healing. But I do believe when he rubbed two stones against each other, or when he hunted animals, he would have injured himself. And in that practice, he would have uh, found, uh, found out about healing as a rudimentary exercise. And this rudimentary exercise was later developed into a sophisticated science, which encompassed diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of elements, ailments. And this can be found in the ancient tablets and uh, the scriptures of many uh, ancient civilizations. For instance, the Egyptian civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization, Chinese civilization, and the Indian civilization. And in this uh, presentation, I'll mostly talk about the Indian civilization. In the field, and uh, we'll be talking about the field of Ayurveda first, and moving on to yoga after that. So Ayurveda is formed out of two words, Ayush and Vidya. So Ayush translates to age or life, and Vidya is knowledge. So Ayurveda is the science of life with a primary aim to prolong human life and prevent diseases. Ayurveda was formed with the purpose of uh, improving the long, increasing the longevity of life and only with a secondary focus of curing disease. And probably before we learned prevention is better than cure, this, uh, th this idea was used by our ancient scholars. So the origins of Ayurveda can be dated back to the Rig Veda and Atharva Veda, which uh, date back to the second millennium BC. And uh, here I will be talking about the two major treatises of Ayurveda, which is uh, Charaka Samhita and Sushruta Samhita. But before moving on to these specific uh, texts, let's first talk about a few general features of Ayurveda. Like I told you, Ayurveda is with, formed with the basic principle of prevention is better than cure. And that is why the primary aim of Ayurveda is prolonging a disease-free life and preventing senility, that is old age. So according to Ayurveda, the cause of diseases or maladies is Tridosha, which is an imbalance between Vayu, Kapha, and Pitta. And the way to cure these maladies is to re-establish the equilibrium between these three elements. And not only that, during an Ayurvedic treatment, the um, Vedyas also try to restore the, um, the normal health of the person, which 
also improves their health in general, not just the treatment of the disease. In Ayurveda, also, we have this uh, uh, Guru Shishya Parampara. I think one of the previous speakers also spoke about Guru Shishya Parampara and how that helped in his firm and uh, uh, in, his, uh, in training his employees. So in Ayurveda also, there's a very strict and arduous process of training where the Shishyas are supposed to stay with their Gurus and receive training and only after years of practice do, can they practice this as a profession. There's also a spiritual side of Ayurveda, which is consistent with the uh, Indian philosophy. And this is the unition of the Atma with the Paramatma. The main aim of Ayurveda, which is prevention of uh, uh, diseases and improving human life, is to, uh, is to supplement this aim so that only a healthy and disease-free body can pursue this journey of unition with the Paramatma. Moving on. Oh, crap. So let's talk about the specific texts, which is Charaka Samhita and Sushrita Samhita. So firstly, these two texts were written in the early centuries of CE. We are not very uh, sure about the exact time these were written, but tentatively, this is uh, what scholars have agreed upon. So the highlights of Shushuta Sanghita are surgical techniques, whereas the highlights of Charaka Sanghita are mainly uh, treatments using uh, natural sources, which include plants, animals, and minerals. So in both of these uh, texts, we can see a large number of drugs from these natural sources have been used to cure a variety of uh, diseases, including diabetes, tuberculosis, and uh, mm, diphtheria. So, I mean, even at that point of time, the identification of diseases and their detailed treatment is quite a big achievement. So in the Sushruta Samhita, one of the major achievements, according to me, is the detailed description of human anatomy. Uh, Galen was uh, one of uh, the Western philosophers. And when we talk about the history of uh, medical sciences, he's generally, we generally talk about Galen. But Galen, he had a few erroneous beliefs about anatomy, and that was mainly because he used animal cadavers for dissection. Whereas in India, centuries before him, Shushruta used human cadavers and using a very, very scientific method to dissect them, which he has also illustrated in his book. So his anatomy was near perfect, almost. I mean, he had identified and uh, even at that time, he had identified the process of circulation of blood. He recognized that the heart is the organ which circulates blood, and the blood is circulated throughout the body. This was an idea which was not known to the Western civilization till uh, Thomas uh, Harvey gave the idea of blood circulation. Another important achievement is plastic surgery. Shushruta uh, used to perform plastic surgeries of nose and uh, the ear. The current rhinoplasty procedure has a huge resemblance with what Shushruta used to do centuries back. Apart from that, the surgical instruments used by Shushruta are also quite close to what is used today. In Charaka Samhita, one of the major achievements is the scientific rational he uses to treat different elements, ailments. So, uh, before that, he starts with a detailed pariksha of his patients. And he also recognizes that each patient is unique. Uh, he takes into account the prakriti of each patient. And for every patient, depending on his symptoms and his own uh, uh, constituent characteristics, he had a unique system of treatment. And this kind of treatment is also followed in the pristine Ayurvedic treatments. For instance, the Ashtavedya tradition of Kerala. And apart from that, Charaka Samhita also gave a, attached a lot of importance with the psychosomatic approach, that is the well, wellness of both the mind and the body, which he called the Deho Manasa approach. So all these achievements, like right now, if I talk about it, probably this is common right now. I mean, right now we have Botox to improve, uh, I mean, to uh, delay the process, I mean, or rather to mask the process of old age. But at that time, also, people had this idea of prolonging human life and avoiding old age. So this, in, according to me, is at least a huge achievement. And even if we don't recognize it now, it's still something to ponder on, upon. So what is the relevance of Ayurveda in 21st century? 
right now, most of our research is, uh, based, uh, is mostly focused on finding a treatment for cancer or certain cardiovascular or neurodegenerative diseases. And we most often try to find such treatments in Ayurveda. But one more important thing to note here is Ayurveda was something which existed centuries ago. And probably most of these diseases, which are a result of the lifestyle changes occurring in the 21st century, might not have existed then. And even if a cure exists, probably most of us are not knowledgeable enough to discern the knowledge present in these texts. I'll uh, uh, reintroduce this topic while I'm concluding. But uh, for now, let's, uh, let's give it a rest and move on to the next point, which is, uh, uh, the Ashtavedya tradition of Kerala, where the Ayurvedic tradition is almost present in its uh, pristine form, where they have used the uh, Ashtangra Dhaya as their basic text, and uh, which, and along with that, used a fusion of certain folk healing traditions and followed the Guru Shishya Parampara. And their treatment is still, uh, in some sense, pristine, and uh, it's still not. Uh, uh, altered or uh, changed. And even now, their treatments are, might be slow, but they are uh, devoid of any side effects and uh, efficacious as modern medicine, or probably more efficacious than modern medicine. And I maybe need not mention this, but yeah, Chavan Prash and Vyakharashtra are still found in our homes, and we still, our mother still used to forcibly give us that one tablespoon of Chavan Prash every day morning. And, uh, and the people who have used it probably know the positive effects of using uh, of one tablespoon of Chavan Prash every day. Now let's move on to yoga. Now yoga, uh, right now we recently celebrated yoga on 25th June. But the yoga which is currently known to us as probably a series of uh, asanas or uh, let's say uh, rhythmic readings isn't what, I mean, isn't actually yoga. The yoga that was once practiced in our country was, formed, uh, was performed with a purpose to unite the mind, body, and the soul with the divine. Yoga was a method of unition with the divine. And this knowledge, uh, Lord Shiva has been hailed as the Adi Guru, who probably gave this knowledge, uh, brought this knowledge to earth. And uh, Maharishi Patanjali has been regarded by many as uh, the compiler of the Yoga Sutras, which are currently regarded as uh, the formal philosophy of yoga. And uh, it is in the mo uh, medieval time that the Hatha Yoga form was uh, moved on, uh, was uh, adopted as the current prevalent practice of yoga. So right now yoga, when I was a kid, probably Yoga wasn't that, I mean, the modern generation doesn't consider yoga to be as effective. But recently with Ramdev Baba organizing so many sessions and uh, with live telecast uh, sessions of yoga, a lot of people have adopted this practice and have acknowledged its positive effects. And it, uh, I guess people have understood the synergic effects of yoga uh, have helped people to get relief from chronic pain during uh, chemotherapy sessions or even during uh, even for uh, during physiotherapy sessions but apart from that apart from the healing purposes yoga has all has given a peace of mind to a lot of people the people who generally engage in yoga can understand the peace of mind and well-being they have gained because of yoga and that's probably because yoga is as i've said a way of uniting our soul with the Paramatma, which is probably the only road to true happiness, true eternal happiness. And apart from that, according to my personal opinion, right now, yoga is not something which is just limited to India. You can probably see yoga in TV, where it is practiced in some remote corners of the world, like not just USA or uh, Europe, it's it's there in like small islands in the Pacific or uh, probably in places which you wouldn't have imagined a few years ago. The problem with that, I have no problem with yoga traveling to so many places in the world, but the only problem is they have altered yoga. I mean, the yoga as it was is not being done. Right now, yoga is probably fused with modern dance techniques. Yoga is fused to uh, 
I, I, to provide pleasure, which according to me is wrong. I mean, in that way, they're maligning our heritage and our tradition. The only thing is we should know what our tradition is and what our heritage is. The way we, we are trying to protect Taj Mahal, we should try to protect yoga. We should recognize yoga as the her rich heritage of India and try to protect it as it is. Uh, with this, I would like to move on to the con conclusion of my uh, presentation. Here, I would like to slightly divert the topic. Here, I would like to introduce to you Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn was an uh, uh, American scientist who later on uh, did his PhD in philosophy of science and the history of science. And he wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions in 1962, and which in a way revolutionized the field of uh, history of science or the philosophy of science. And I'll tell you why. Before his uh, book came, there was this view, there was this Whiggish view of history. What is Whiggish view of history? According to this, people try to see the past through the lens of the present. So what happens as a result is we see science advancing. So right now, you would say that 10 years, 10 years back, whatever the science was, that is probably not as good as what we have right now. Probably that is why a huge fraction of my generation considers yoga and Ayurveda to be old and antiquated and probably not as effective as modern biomedicine. So uh, Kuhn also, he was not talking about Ayurveda and yoga, but he was talking about science, uh, science in general. So he gave this idea of scientific paradigms. So he said that in each time there's a particular paradigm. And in that paradigm, people do science in their own way. They have their own terms and they have their own way of doing science. But later, the paradigm shifts. Like there was the Copernican paradigm and, uh, sorry, there was the, um, before the Copernican paradigm came up, there was another paradigm. And then later there was Newtonian paradigm. And now there's the new paradigm of quantum mechanics. So similarly, why can't we view the field of medical sciences in, a terms, in terms of paradigms? So let's consider Ayurveda as a separate paradigm. And let's consider modern biomedicine as a separate paradigm. So if we try to see Ayurveda from our paradigm, we might be wrong in interpreting it. I mean, a lot of terms which have been used in Ayurveda might not, they cannot be translated. They cannot be translated into English or Hindi or any other languages which, are which we are using currently. We probably cannot find a current translation of the words uh, Vayu, Kapha, and Pitta. Probably in a way, Shushruta or Charaka visualized these terms. Like for example, the word dharma doesn't have an exact translation in English. So what I'm trying to say is, we prob right now we're trying to open new Ayurvedic um, education centers where we're trying to integrate ancient Ayurveda with modern biomedicine so that we can provide more career opportunities to a lot of people in the field of Ayurveda itself. But a major flaw is we cannot translate these terms. I mean, Ayurveda has to be studied in its paradigm, with its own terms, and in its own culture. Probably, that is why uh, a remote section in Kerala, the Ashtavedya tradition, has uh, has thrived in this way. I mean, it has. They have followed a Guru Shishya parampara, where they have maintained their own ancient uh, healing practices, and they have evolved it with their own experiences after being trained in the existing uh, paradigm. So what I'm trying to say is, if we want to protect these ancient sciences, Ayurveda and Yoga, in their pristine form, we should encourage the, uh, encourage the incorporation of this knowledge in their respective paradigms, the way they were taught centuries ago. And there are certain pockets where it's still being done that way, and we should encourage such, uh, such traditions and such pockets, and try to indoctrinate more people into such paradigms. So that is why. I think uh, I have uh, conveyed I my point. And so with this, I would just like to say that uh, we should recognize that this is as much a part of our heritage as uh, the ancient monuments or probably our ancient uh, attires are. And that's why we should give it the respect it deserves and preserve it as it is. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Rishika. Now, uh, I request Abhishek Deshpande to present his uh, views.
the title of his talk is contribution of ancient india ancient india to modern science a benedict ben site to by our visionary forefathers to today's aeon abhishek you have 15 minutes to present your present presentation Good evening, everybody. Myself, Abhishek Rajendraesh Pandey from Dr. Anna Sahib Shinde College of Agriculture Engineering, Mahatma Phule Krishi Vidya Pit, MPK Viraori, Maharashtra. Uh, I am going to present a topic: uh, contribution of ancient India to science, a benedicite by our visionary forefathers. Introduction: uh, We know that uh, science has changed uh, human life throughout. Uh, when we focus on the transformation in human culture from the tribal life to the today's prosperous age of human. we get some amazing facts western world has contributed lot for scientific development we know the scholars and scientists like uh, uh, albert einstein or uh, erwin erwin schrodinger have given the uh, lot of uh, efforts for development of the scientific field but uh, we have to consider the condition of the ancient india in that uh, period of time then india was a poor colony exploited by the imperialistic uh, master ships like the british raj Uh, so let's check the scientific perspective of india when it was a free nation and wa uh, was not chained by the imperialistic master ships some western scholars uh, like ex uh, like f max muller uh, uh, and other scient uh, other scholars have translated ancient indian scripts uh, from sanskrit to the um, uh, english ancient knowledge is a treasure we must be thankful to our forefathers uh, for that treasure so let us discuss uh, Oh, contribution of our forefathers for, for uh, in field of uh, engineering and technology uh, we will discuss first the agricultural engineering uh, agriculture engineering uh, is the branch which deals with the application of the engineering uh, science uh, engineering science uh, in the field of agriculture uh, appropriate time for sowing seeds uh, this verse is taken from the uh, book krushi parashara which, uh, which is authored by uh, marshi uh, parashara वैशाखे वपनम श्रेष्ठ ज्येष्ठे तो मध्यम श्रुत आषाढ़े चादम प्रोक्त श्रावणे चादमाधम रोपणा तो बीजान शुचौ वपनमुत्तम श्रावणे चादम प्रोक्त बाद्रे चैवादमाधम वृषाते मिथुनादा चिण्य हानिजस्वला बीज न वापय तत्र जन पापादनश्यति दिस् मीन्स दैट वे नो दैट देर आर टू ऑपरेशन इन्क्लूडेड इन द सोईंग दैट इज ऑनली सोईंग एंड ट्रांसप्लांटेशन ऑफ द सीड this uh, verse means that uh, in the sowing operation uh, the vaishaka uh, month is best for the sowing uh, jestha is uh, medium for the sowing uh, ashara is bad for sowing uh, and shravana is the worst period uh, and also for uh, transplantation of the seed uh, hot season should be chosen as uh, it is the best season and uh, shravana is bad and bhadrapada is worst for transplantation also end of jestha and beginning of ashara should be avoided for both sowing and transplantation then uh, soil and water conservation engineering is the sub branch of agriculture engineering ashade shravane masi dhanya ma katte yad budha ana kattam tu yad dhanyam yatha bijam tathe vahi karkate katte yad dhanyam rushto krushi tatpara badre char dad phal prapti phalasha neva chashvine it means that uh, the good farmer uh, should construct the small barns in his field in ashara in shravana when uh, rainfall is there uh, to conserve the water in his field and uh, barns in june Uh, that is in the sign of cancer uh, that is in the june uh, for low low rainfall regions the, for the scarcity of water uh, then burns in bhadrapada that is somewhat late uh, it gives uh, half yield it reduces the yield by half and burns in ashvina that is too late it gives no yield to the farmer so farther is get, uh, farmer is get regretted then uh, drainage engineering nairujjartam hi dhanya nam jalam badre vimochayet तत्र जलरक्षणम भाद्रे च जल संपूर्ण धान्य विविध बाधक प्रपीडित कृषाण न दत्ते फलमुत्तम इट मीन्स दैट ड्रेनेज इन भाद्रपदा मेन्टेन्स क्रॉप हेल्दी वी नो दैट इन भाद्रपदा देर इज एडिकुएट अमाउंट ऑफ रेनफॉल इज देर सो इफ मोर क्वांटिटी ऑफ वॉटर रिमेन्स इन द रूट जोन ऑफ द क्रॉप 
it causes uh, certain uh, fungal diseases that can cause uh, cause damage to the crops so it should be removed by the drainage then uh, second uh, branch of engineering is groundwater hydrology it deals with the uh, it deals with the study of uh, water under uh, underground uh, estimation of groundwater from grass this verse is taken uh, from the uh, book of the uh, from the book of the brot sahita uh, which is authored by the uh, vara mira atrune satruna yasmin satrune truna varjita mayatra tasmina shira pradishta vaktavyam va dhanam chasmin it means that uh, as shown here uh, it means that uh, if in the uh, place where uh, there is no grass if there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, tract full of grass or if in the uh, uh, if in the place full of grass if there is a grassless tract then uh, surely there is a vein of water uh, existing so this is the uh, this is the method of water divining uh, in the ancient india then estimation of ground water by different signs on ground valmika snigdo dakshinena tilakasya sukush uh, durvashveta purushai panchabi rambo dishi varunya shira purva it means that uh, if there is a tilaka tree in your field uh, and to the south of the tilaka tree if there is a ant hill covered with the holy grass that is durva then uh, at the west of the tilaka tree uh, at the 5 uh, cubit distance and at the depth of 25 cubit you will find the water and the water vein which is existing there it is the easterly one then uh, we will head towards the aeronautics uh, the uh, this verse is uh, taken from the uh, brod vaimanik shastra uh, and it is authored by uh, marshi bharadwaja uh, it is about the protection of aircraft akasha panchame kakshe vimana sanchare dyati chatra kola hal jwala vegat basmi krutam bhavet tasmat tat pariharaya raudri darpan yantrakam it means that uh, it means that uh, if accidentally uh, aircraft uh, goes in the fifth layer of the atmosphere due to strong eddies and turbulences it get disturbed and uh, it can be damaged or burnt so uh, to protect uh, it from that uh, strong eddies uh, raudri darpan yantram is uh, used uh, actually darpan is uh, darpan means uh, mirror so uh, some arrangement of the mirror is made to protect the aircraft from the strong eddies then uh, metallurgy uh, rasaratna samachya uh, describes the several metallurgical processes uh, categorization of iron uh, uh, iron is uh, categorized in the uh, three uh, main uh, three main kinds that is munda tikshna and kanta and mrudu kundam and kandaramcha uh, these are the three types of uh, munda iron and kharam saram hannalam taravattam uh, kal loha bi dhanam uh, these are the six sub types of the tikshna loha and uh, brahmakam chumbakam karshakam dravakam and romakantam these are the five sub types of the kanta loha kanta loha uh, implies the loha uh, which is uh, magnetic in the nature then extraction of metal navispulingo na chabudbudascha yathana rekha patalam na shaddam mushagatam ratna samam sthirascha tatha vishuddham prabhaveshcha loham it means that uh, if metal is uh, burnt in the furnace without the sparks of fire bubble crystals uh, and crack, uh, cracking sound then it gives the pure glowing metal in the pure form this is the uh, this is the process of purification of the metal then uh, preparation of bell metal swalpa talam yutam kansam vankanalena taditam muktarangam hitat tamram ghosta krushtam mudavratam it means that when mixture of uh, bronze and arsenic sulfide is heated in vankanal apparatus this is the apparatus uh, mentioned in the rasaratna samuchaya if uh, this process is done then uh, some arsenic sulfide gets evaporated in that process and gosha krishta is obtained gosha krishta is nothing but a bell metal then uh, we will uncover the some amazing facts about ancient metallurgy in 4th century bc king purushottama presented indian made, uh, made steel to the alexander uh, in 8th century ad high quality steel swords were exported to damascus syria and uh, scientists of the uh, today's era they have uh, concluded that uh, these swords are made up of uh, by the nanotechnology Uh, 5th century bc sushruta ancient indian surgeon made and used sharp instruments of metal for different surgeries then uh, civil engineering uh, mayasura has uh, written the book uh, mayamatam from which this verse has taken uh, it is about the roofs for houses and uh, it uh, it tells that the roasted clay tiles or metal sheets can be used as a roof cover for the house which should be strong and without holes 
then uh, manufacturing of bricks uh, is also uh, told in that uh, it, uh, it gives the uh, systematic process for manufacturing of bricks uh, it tells that bricks uh, must be free from gravel pebbles and rot roots uh, fill the clods of clay in knee deep water pound 40 times with the feet and uh, here are given a sap of, a sap of some uh, trees uh, it is in sanskrit uh, if uh, if we soak in the sap of fig, kadamba, mango, abaya, aksha and in the water of myrobalan for 3 months then we can get the good quality of bricks. Then uh, after that uh, how to regenerate this ancient knowledge? Conservation of Sanskrit language uh, is the basic need uh, because uh, so many ancient texts are uh, generally in the uh, Sanskrit, uh, written in the Sanskrit language so it should be conserved. Then uh, search for ancient texts uh, should be done because uh, for example we have lost uh, about 1000 shakhas of Vedas uh, over the period of time and we have only 11 shakhas of Vedas are available at present day so we have to conserve the ancient text and search for the uh, uh, search for the ancient text uh, then academic, cur academic curriculums uh, should be designed uh, to maintain uh, and to conserve the ancient text and Sanskrit language then establishment of universities for research the separate universities uh, should be there for research in this field. Uh, incentives and scholarship for those uh, scholars who are doing research in the field of uh, ancient knowledge. Then programs at school and university level. Uh, uh, programs at university and school level will encourage the uh, uh, encourage the children to take participation uh, in uh, regenerating this ancient knowledge. Then initiative by private organizations for this and initiative by government in research and development field. Then uh, coming towards conclusion, uh, contribution of ancient India should not be evaluated by comparing it with the western world. Then need of independent studies on relation of ancient India and science. Uh, it's time to begin pursuit for knowledge which is hidden from the centuries and continuous efforts and dedication is only the way towards this destination. At last uh, I will hope for the uh, noble India which will undertake the creativity which will support the innovation but not on the cost of forgetting uh, the our glorious past and uh, works of our glorious uh, forefathers. Thank you. These are some references uh, I have used to uh, make this essay. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Abhishek. Questions will be taken in the last. Yeah. Questions will be taken in the last. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Arokia Raj, who will present, who is the first prize winner of this essay competition. So the title is Contribution of Ancient India to Science. Contributions of Ancient India to Science Introduction The essay Contribution of Ancient India to Science demonstrates the simplicity, purity of heart and the constant endeavor of the ancient Indian seers in contributing to science through their profound scientific discoveries, ideas, concepts and technologies. It also finds a way out to solve various social evils existing in our societies through the insights and ethics of the ancient Indian scientist and in creating a harmonious and peaceful society. It aims at a conclusion that no fields in modern and contemporary science is left untouched by the ancient Indians. Revisiting Ancient India In order to visit our ancient India, we need to take a trip on ancient Indian scriptures. In the beautiful stories of Ramayana and Mahabharata, we can learn the social structure, the standard of living, and the seeds of science. From those stories, one can think and feel that we had laser rays, destructive weapons, missiles, drugs that give immortality, and various means of transportation. Mathematics. The ancient Indian mathematicians who contributed to mathematics are Baudhyayan, Aryabhata, 
Brahmagupta, Bhaskaracharya, Mahaviracharya and few others. The integrative quality of Indian thought may be seen in its formulation of the concept of zero as the unifying unit of both philosophical and mathematical inquiry. In the Artha Shastra, we are given the weights and measures which were in use in North India in the 4th century BC. In Baudhiyana found in Krishna Yajurveda and in Apstamba Sutra, we can find some references to Diophantine equations. Pythagoras theorem is stated in Shalva Sutra. Ayurveda and Surgery Shushruta and Charaka were two outstanding figures in medicine. Shushruta wrote a valuable book on medicine in which he described many surgical operations including cataract, lithotomy and hernia. He enumerated and described 121 surgical instruments and advocated dissection. Charaka also published an encyclopedia of medicine and helped to establish the practice of medicine on a high ethical basis. Antiseptic surgery, anesthesia, antidotes for poisons and vaccination were practiced in India. Astronomy The astronomical siddhantas of ancient India have also given correlative conclusions with the Puranic text in specific relation with planetary motions and cosmic affairs. The Indian astronomer Bhaskara I, hundreds of years before Bruno and Galileo, discovered that the earth was going around the sun and that it takes 365.2587-56484 days for earth to make one circuit around the sun. The Indians knew the 28 phases of the moon, the fact that the earth rotates on its axis and the explanation of the eclipses. The concept of atom. Indian atomism was certainly independent of Greek influence for an atomic theory was taught by Pakuda Katiyana, an older contemporary of the Buddha and was therefore earlier than that of Democritus. The Vaisheshika school which especially elaborated its atomic doctrines and was the school of atomism par excellence maintained that before combining form material objects atoms made primary combinations of dyads and triads. This doctrine of molecules was developed differently by Buddhists and Ajivikas. The concept of space. Endless space is expressed in Ishopanishad which says Infinity arises from infinity. If you subtract infinity from infinity, infinity remains. Regarding the vastness of the universe, the Vishnu Purana says that there are countless Brahmanandas in the universe. This is proved by modern science today. The concept of gravity. A great mathematician of 450 BC was Varaha Mihira. He used to state that there were some attractive forces in the stars of the universe. Due to the sum total of such forces, the Vasundra was able to float. This can be considered just a step before the most talked gravitational force. We also have a reference to gravity in Siddhanta Siromani Bhavanakosham 6 of Bhaskara II which says, This earth attracts whatever solid materials are in the space by her own force of attraction towards her. The theory of relativity. The principle of relativity was available in an embryonic form in the Indian philosophical concept of Sapekshavad. The literal translation of this Sanskrit word is theory of relativity. Chemistry. Ancient India's development in chemistry found its growth in a variety of practical activities. We know from the evidence of Iron Pillar of Delhi and other sources that Indian metallurgists gained great proficiency in the extraction of metal from ore and in metal casting. Nagarjuna being a 10th century scientist aimed experiments to transform base elements into gold like the western world's alchemists. Quantum Mechanics The atom of Buddhism in some measure resembles the quantum of Planck's. According to Vedanta, we can never have a theory of everything in terms of matter or interaction of material particles only. Embryology In the Vedic literature, there is a vast description on the science of embryology and role of prenatal sound on the child within womb. Garbha Upanishad is one of the ancient Upanishads which serves as a concise thesis on embryology. Evolution Padma Purana gives a detailed statement regarding different forms of life as you see. This shows the process of evolution in a little way. 
towards a science sustained spirituality as ta taught by Indian science. The first aphorism of Vedanta Sutra states, Athato Brahma Jigyasa. In the human form of life, one should inquire about Brahman, the absolute truth. Scientific study of matter is Aparavidya, whereas knowledge of the science of God is Paravidya. Therefore, ancient India and its scriptures lead us to the absolute truth or higher knowledge. Towards an ethical foundation for humanization as taught by ancient Indian science. Ancient India and her science taught morality in a significant way. The morals of the people were very pure. Robbery and other crimes were very rare as people lived a contented life. Hospitality was enjoined upon all. Great respect and affection was shown to guests. To speak the truth was considered a religious duty. Seduction and adultery were regarded as sins. Even ancient Indian education tried its best in creation of a development of character and discipline. Killing of any sort is violence according to ancient wisdom and hence teaches us a great lesson on non-violence. The Hindu scriptures teach us that plants have a sort of dormant and latent consciousness and are capable of pleasure and pain. Thus, asks us to cultivate an eco-spiritual love towards nature and all its living creatures. India is the source of some of the most powerful schools of thought of mankind with Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita expressing Hindu philosophy and the Tripitakas summarizing the Buddhist views. Both philosophical systems with their great respect for all beings and expressions of compassion may be fruitful sources of a universal ethical system and today the world is in need of compassion. Our ancient Indian science of embryology teaches us that we are born for making peace and happiness in human race. To conclude, ancient India has provided a nurturing environment of freedom to explore the vast realm of science which is true even till today. Today's world is being influenced by the powerful social force science but what is needed in today's modern science is a change in the value temper of scientists and technologies to have the capability for making value analysis and value judgment about scientific matters and to have a great accountability for the consequences of their scientific pursuits. This is very well and systematically taught by ancient Indian sages and scientists during the ancient times. Henceforth, we Indians should feel proud of our ancient scientists and Vedic heritage and should launch research programs that enable the inclusion of the ancient Indian wisdom in the context of modern scientific world so that this world may turn into a world of happiness and peace paradise. Thank you one and all for your patient listening. Thank you Arukya. Now we will take few questions. Uh, so, yes, audience, any questions? So, let me interpret the presentations to the best of my abilities. Rishika primarily talked about Ayurveda and Yoga and the message that she gave is that we need to keep them as they exist. Yeah, rather than giving our scientific interpretations. But to some extent I disagree with, the, with this type of formalism because uh, we have different systems of knowledge, we have different systems of you know uh, curing things and uh, there will be some synthesis somewhere. Synthesis is an important platform. So while everything in Ayurveda may not be, you know, connected, some correlations can be done. Like there was a paper from Prashar et al. who conveyed that the Pitta Vata Kapha have genomic correlation. There was a paper that was published. So similarly, uh, the empirical component of the ancient India, it will have some relevance like Professor Ghosh published one article in which uh, he conveyed that basmas have this nano, uh, they are like nano drugs, they are nano powders. So we cannot simply close our eyes 
this is how I, I see it but your message in the right direction I would put it is like this that while the empirical component of the ancient India can be you know analyzed in the light of modern science some components of ancient science are beyond the capacity of science so what is beyond the capacity of science should be valued should be preserved and the heritage should be continued and whatever is coming into the light of science it should be testified yeah so that's how i try to put your argument then uh, Abhishek gave wonderful verses. Uh, so these wonderful verses are very nice, but uh, what we require is a little bit more or uh, deeper analysis. I can give you one example. I once went to Bali, it's a city called Denpasar. So in Denpasar, one professor was working on computational fluid dynamics of houses constructed with Vastu. So, this type of, you know, studies would be more relevant because the modern, I mean, the modern man is convinced about ancient sciences. Uh, like the tall buildings they used to construct in India, I mean, the, the entire house looks like air conditioned. You know, this type of studies uh, that have more relevance would be useful. You are from agricultural background, so I can see that you have put a lot of emphasis there. So just go a little bit more into these aspects and try to have a more mature component. And Arukiya, you, are, you have covered almost all the areas and finally you conveyed that ethics is very important. And yes, that is the message that we should always take from our ancient Indian sciences that while the empirical knowledge is always there, it is not enough. Uh, ethics is, an, is at a super, uh, it is at a higher level, it's called super science, philosophy, ethics, uh, all these things. Uh, so, uh, with this uh, I conclude my uh, summary of the pr uh, wonderful presentations. I request everyone to kindly give a uh, nice applause for all the essay competition winners. The prizes of the winners will be distributed in a later session. So you are all here. Till the end. Okay, so we will announce to you tomorrow morning maybe or maybe later onwards when the prizes will be distributed. Okay, with this I finish this session. Yeah, so please. So, what a beautiful and thoughtful series of sessions given by these young minds. May I request uh, Professor Ram Gopal to present mementos to these uh, young thought provokers. Right? So, first to Mr. Arukiya Raj. Mr. Abhishek Tesh Pandey. And then last to Miss Rishika Behra. Now I will request Mr. Milinder Segar to come here and present a memento to Professor Ram Gopal. So thank you everyone.